Hello. In today's video we will dismantle and carry out some repairs on a video recorder which is so completely overboard that it was almost certainly the most complex video recorder ever sold in the domestic market. We're going to work on the legendary Sony EVS9000E. Fortunately we have the service manual to help which as you can see is very comprehensive. There's a lot in here. However, just in case you think everything always goes well in the videos of this kind, you will see me make a terrible, terrible mistake. The e Hi8 EVS9000 has a number of features which set it apart from other domestic video recorders of the time, of any format. Some of these features were eventually available on other models, but some were not. Here are a few key points. It had four channel audio with the ability to do digital stereo audio dubbing. It had an integral digital time base corrector and digital freeze frame. Some SVHS decks came with this later. Rewritable time code like professional studio decks. And an edit controller allowed automatic assemble editing from an 8mm camcorder. You may have seen me demonstrate the digital audio dubbing feature on a previous video. This is not the same machine, but another in my fleet, and it has several problems. Firstly, and rather cosmetically, the control panel does not slide out properly. It usually requires a bit of a tug to get it started. Now, let's put in a tape and press fast forward. You can hear a regular ticking noise from the mechanism, and after a few seconds it aborts. We will rewind the tape a little to reduce the chance of damage. You can hear the ticking noise during eject too. The cause is either the supply spool or the take-up spool or both are split. This seems to be caused by the plastic shrinking slightly over time, but since the metal support of the spools does not shrink with it, there comes a point when the plastic gears break. We'll have to strip down the deck to replace whichever spools have failed. Furthermore, last time I checked, there was a picture quality issue on this machine, so there's a possibility of something else to fix there too. Firstly, my trusty helper Scott will assist me in removing the machine to get it onto the bench. Okay, let's take this apart and uh, find out which uh, component has failed in the mechanism. There can be a set of um, panels that sit on the side here, on the left hand and right hand side. I don't know what they're really for, but they slot in here and take up uh, at least one of these screw slots. Um, so you may have a slightly different uh, arrangement, more screws to undo than, than I have. You may have longer screws here where the side panels fit on. There's a large earthing shield on the top here, which we need to remove. There's a, an earthing screw at the back. We need to remember to put that back later. So here we can see the deck. There's the supply and take up spools through here, but you don't have good enough access to work on it as it stands. You really want to get the deck out. That's a bit harder than it needs to be. I'm going to release these clips to uh, take the front cover off. Now, to get access to the deck, there's one screw buried under here, so we need to take this PCB off. That 
one there. screws for the deck there's earthing wires on that one one thing I want to show you here also while we're here is this this is the digital time base corrector module and the capacitors in there do fail uh, so sometimes you can get the situation where you've got a really terrible picture and if you deselect the time base corrector in the menu then the picture will come clear and that's a sure sign that the capacitors have failed in there um, it's a bit hideous to change them but I have swept right through several of those replacing all the capacitors in the past now I can disconnect the wiring to the deck. So there's this cable here and this multi-way one here. Very great care, don't want to rip it. Guess he's just ripped the cable. However my hard job however hard my job was before is now a lot harder because I've just torn some of the connectors on that cable. really didn't want to do that and then there's a connector at the back here okay now we have the deck out and now I have a major problem I've got to repair about three or four contacts on this flexi cable oh joy okay now you can see I've repaired the cable that I damaged um, I didn't need to show you the uh, process of repairing that because of course you won't make my mistake and you won't damage that cable will you? you learn from my mistake now we can get on with actually fixing the proper fault one of these spools will have a split at least one of these spools and potentially both of them so to get good access to this we're going to take the cassette carriage off I'll remove the uh, video recorder deck out, main machine out of the way so we can just work on the deck It's all about finding the correct screwdriver for these screws that hold the cassette carriage down. You don't want to bodge this up because it'll chew up the screws. Perfect. Really good grip on that. Three screws holding that carriage down. Now we have good access to the deck and we can see which of these spools has split. Well, certainly there's a big crack in the supply spool on the left. Ah. Take up spool as well. In fact, the take up spool is split in two places. and the supply spool split in two places so there's no chance at all of salvaging either of those they definitely need to be replaced now here's the nuisance factor both of these spools have a complication associated with them the supply spool if anything is the worst because you have to take this back tension band off and that will mean resetting the back tension and I've just noticed I've got markings on there I've done this one in the past let me zoom in a bit and you can have a look so 
So here's the point here that the back tension arm is calibrated, if you like. No, it isn't. It's along here. Well, in manufacture, they will have put a tool in here that sits in this hole and has um, a geared um, a kind of a geared screwdriver, if you like, that will alter the back tension by adjusting this back tension band. But without the proper equipment to measure back tension, you can't really use that. So I've, in the past, just used a marker pen to mark where I think the back tension band sits because it slides this way. So I've used a marker pen here when I've replaced this supply spool in the past. So marvellous. Long time ago I've obviously repaired this deck and now it needs repairing again. That's a right nuisance. So that's the supply spool problem. The take up spool is almost as bad because from what I remember to take the take up spool off I think you have to take the pinch roller off and that's all rather fiddly. I actually do have a brand new spare pinch roller here, but I don't believe that will need replacing. Setting up the back tension can be a bit um, hit and miss affair since we don't have a back tension gauge. Well, if you do, marvellous, good luck to you, but I don't. And the main effect can be that if the back tension is too low, you'll see that in fast forward the tape will ride up over the pinch roller. And you can think, oh, the pinch roller is defective, that's the cause of that, but it's not necessarily the pinch roller, it could be your back tension setting. So, um, oh dear, where do I begin? This job is going to be much bigger than I wanted it to be. Let's start by, we're going to remove the back tension band. So, as you can see here, I've put some ink in the past there on where this plastic stops and I've just scratched it with my fine point here so I can see exactly where to set it when I put it back well fairly exact going to remove this cover here. I think you need to remove this, whichever of the spools you are replacing. This is the real idler. Just sliding this plastic component out of the way, it's sprung loaded. And now I can just simply lift the defective supply spool off. Looking at these new parts, table assembly reel it says, um, and that one of these says supply and one says take up, I believe. Yes, S and T. So S is supply. Quick visual check to make sure the brand new part is good. Because of course these are new old stock, they've been lying around for a while. Absolutely perfect. 
see if I can set you up there so you can see the teeth. Now I'm going to be lining this up with the mark I'd left on the deck, bearing in mind the thickness of the metal piece here and it's how close into the plastic it got. It really is super critical. So that way is less back tension and that way is more back tension. Set the back tension too high and you'll wear the heads out. You really don't want to go that way. Set it too low and you'll have problems with possibly tracking and certainly with fast forward risk of the tape popping out over the top of the pinch roller. Right, we'll have to test that later to make sure the back, ten back tension is good. Now for the supply spool. Thought that one was bad. I had it in my memory that you have to remove the pinch roller. I may be completely wrong. Let's get this bad part out of my way. Hmm. Now that seemed a bit easy. Okay. Take up sport. Why did I have it in my head you have to remove the pinch roller? Maybe in some previous occasion I've had to remove the pinch roller for some other reason. Before I fit that, I'll just again check it, make sure it's in good order. Everything looks fine. The 
actually swing this metal bar out of the way in order to drop the spool in and also this brake that's all good I seem to have disturbed the um, I've disturbed the real idler there but that's okay can get back on that's all good the cover over the top of the real idler Now we can refit the cassette carriage. There's something on my mind now. I'm just going to do these screws up, but I'm I'm just thinking out aloud about the alignment of the gears on the cassette carriage relative to the deck below that drives it. On some machines, the alignment doesn't matter. But on others, you have to set the gears so they are correctly synchronized. And I don't remember whether this model cares or not. Looking at it, that's just driven by there. No, it doesn't care. I'm fairly sure there's no alignment criticality between this gear here and this one underneath. Not on this model. Everything looks okay, including my repair to the cable that I shouldn't have broken in the first place. I actually, I'll let you into secret here, I've got a scrap machine. It was actually a prototype of all things, not a original, not a part that came out of the, not a machine that came out of the factory for use. And I thought, well, that, that never, never was going to work again anyway. The prototype's got so many faults. So I'll raid the cable from that one and fit it in here and only to find that the cable was um, torn on the prototype machine as well. So it's not just me who managed to make that mistake, somebody else did it too. Okay, now let's uh, refit the deck to this machine. I've got to plug in the cable that I so carelessly broke earlier. as well as this multi-way cable at the back, which I might do first actually.
this is small motor cable here. And the multi-way connector on the side. properly. I'll temporarily put the front panel cable uh, front panel together. Tell you what, I'll fit this um, rather crazy screw at the front to secure the deck. Refit the front, which has its own multi-way uh, connector here. Did I capture that last time? Maybe not. There's a multi-way connector here. Now I'll power it up and see if the deck runs. have a problem. You should have accepted that tape and it's not. So it's not powering down. So we uh, have a fault. Oh joy. Now, I'll miss a bit out of what happened next because it was too long to record it all. But it's fast to say, though my repaired cable metered out okay, I think the soldering onto the connector made it not fit properly into the socket on the board. And as it happened, I found another scrap machine in my storeroom. So I raided the good cable from that and got the deck running. However, now it would struggle to rewind. And the problem turned out to be that the back tension was set too high. Now, back tension, in case you don't know, is a resistance of the supply spool uh, during, usually on playback, uh, which provides tension to the tape as it goes past the heads. And this applies to all audio and video formats. I was surprised that the back tension system was still engaged during rewind, but it is on this deck. And there was a problem. It was set too high, so the rewind was extremely sluggish. So I adjusted that and got the deck to work properly, both in rewind, fast forward and play. The reason that the back tension was set too high was because I'd set the back tension band to be in exactly the same position as it was on the previous supply spool. Now due to manufacturing tolerances or otherwise, maybe a manufacturing design change, the size of the spool where the back tension band um, bears against was different on the new supply spool and that caused a, a fairly significant change in the back tension setting. So I adjusted that and when it backed off a little the deck ran fine. So next we need to connect up the machine and look at the picture. Oh dear there's something terribly wrong here. I'm sure it didn't look that bad last time I tried it but it was a while ago. It's been powered down for some time. This smacks of capacitor trouble. Let's first do that trick with switching off the time base corrector TBC function to see if it helps. Uh, no it doesn't, so the fault probably lies elsewhere. There are two possible PCBs in the signal path which could be responsible. They are both quite inaccessible and both have hundreds of electrolytic capacitors which could require replacement. So where to start? 
Well, looking at the diagrams, my gut feeling is that the smaller of the two boards, VI121, is the most likely. It's certainly the easier to change anyway. So let's swap that out with one from the scrap machine initially to see where that gets us. Replacing these boards means taking off the front panel sockets, removing the lower screening plate, uh, and undoing lots of connectors. It's pretty time consuming. I fitted a replacement VI121 board from a scrap machine to help with debugging. And here's the picture we get now. That's much better, so it proves we have the right board. But look closely and you will see a dark patch on the left side of the picture. So it's likely that this board has a fault, though the dark patch might be caused by an unrelated fault in another panel. The machine might just about do in this state for some of the work I use it for, but let's keep working on the fault. I took the bad board, which has a towel picture, up to the workshop to work on capacitor replacement. There are dozens of electrolytic capacitors on this board, and virtually all of them are out of spec. It's not practical to replace every single one of them. This would be too time consuming and risk board damage. The pads and tracks on this board are very thin. It's very hard to extract the defective capacitors without inflicting damage. And I've had to do some repairs because of pad damage. This makes the job very time consuming. So in an ideal world, I would replace every single electrolytic capacitor on here. In the real world, I've had to look at those capacitors directly related to a uh, playback picture. Firstly, there's a lot of supply decoupling. And I'm not saying that that's not important, but there are, I think there's enough supply decoupling in place that it wouldn't stop the board working because some of those capacitors are low in value. So I'm going to miss those out. I worked on all the elect electrolytic capacitors which are in the actual circuits of playback chain. This took me hours. I then had to refit the board to the machine and test it. Expecting things to be much better, I was horrified to find no video output at all with this recapped board in place. You can see here, many of these capacitors have been changed, including ones inside this can here. So I've broken something. We're not doing very well here. I have another machine with an audio fault. So I borrowed the VI121 board from that and fitted it into the machine I'm repairing. Let's have a look at the picture now. There, that's fixed the picture. And it doesn't have the dark patch on the left-hand side like the other spare board did. Next to the problem with the drawer slider. You can hear that the motor is spinning, but it's not moving. So this must mean that the drive coupling on the motor is split. It's a bit fiddly to get out. So I decided to drop the entire lower assembly over from one of the other machines. That worked well for about 20 seconds. And then there was the most horrible smell of fish. And I've always hated fish. And then the display went out. At this point I dismantled the lower drawer assemblies to make one out of two, and that worked fine. But I'm not giving up that easily, so I pulled out the motor with a defective drive coupling. I'm going to attempt to glue that together later. I think that'll work okay. I've had failure of the display before. It is due to capacitors inside this metal screening box where Sony built a DC to DC converter. It was the 330 microfarad 35 volt capacitor which was doing all the stinking. <laughs> Ooh. and two other capacitors in there had also failed, leaking electrolyte all over the PCB. Once cleaned up and new capacitors fitted, the display now works properly. So I have a good spare display for next time one of these fails. There are a few other things I need to tell you about these. The deck is shared with a much simpler EVC2000 machine. These though lack the PCM digital audio, the digital time base corrector, um, the edit controller and other features which make the EVS 9000E so special. They do however include the high speed rewind feature making them some of the very few 8mm decks which can rewind with the tape unlaced. There was an important change to the firmware on later models of the EVS 9000E. I don't know the exact serial number at which the change was implemented but it was in place from at least serial number 11778, which is what one of mine is. Before then, every time the player hit a glitch or a gap on the tape, it would put the on-screen graphics on, such as a play arrow, or depending on the tape, the word stereo would appear on screen. Well, if you're trying to edit, this is just a complete pain. So from that model number or earlier, they fixed it, and the on-screen graphics would only appear when the tape was inserted and only appear the once. I plan on making a modification to one of these machines to see if I can switch off the on-screen graphics when not wanted. 
Now, as well as all the other capacitor problems we've looked at, be aware that the capacitor can also fail in the power supply, causing the machine to not work at all or give a very grainy, noisy picture with patterning or act strangely. The power supply is this metal box here. It's quite easy to take out and work on. The low voltage electrolytic capacitors should all be replaced. There are not that many. I use high quality low ESR capacitors for these. Ordinary capacitors will not work in some of these positions, causing the power supply to make a strange hissing sound. Last year I repaired an earlier model, <coughs> the EVS 1000. It's a lovely looking machine. This one doesn't have the digital time base corrector or edit controller, but is otherwise quite well specified. And working examples of this model are very rare indeed. It might even be that there's the last working one in the country. Tell me in the comments if you have one. Right, I have a good working EVS 9000, but for how long? It's not been possible to replace all the capacitors which I really wanted to replace in there. Furthermore, the supply and take-up spools keep splitting and they're hard to source. I will include the uh, part numbers in the description below. There will come a time when these machines become impossible to repair and they all disappear. Now I have another one here. This one I bought back in around 1996 and it cost me some £1,500. The capstan servos failed so the speed is erratic. Capacitor trouble of course. So that's another one to repair later. So it feels like we're coming to the end for these machines. It was a legend in its day, but its days are now severely numbered. If there was one other machine of comparable complexity, it would have been the Sony DHR1000UX, which looks very similar to the EVS9000, and this was a digital model that came along later. I hope you've learned something from this rather long and in-depth video. Please do like, share, and especially subscribe, so I'll do more uh, videos on audio and video technology in the future. Bye for now.